fascists will definitely mess it up. In fact, the reason they are so desperate is because in state after state they were losing the elections. But you see now whether they are in power or not, they've injected this poison into the veins of a very complex country. And that's very frightening, very, very frightening to have to deal with on a daily basis because you, you cannot imagine the things that happened in Gujarat. You know, little children were, 2,000 people were killed. Women were raped. Women had their stomachs slit open and their fetuses pulled out. Not one or two, but many, many. Little children were forced to drink petrol and then matches were put down their throats. They just blew up like bombs, you know. So it's a very, very frightening situation just now. And this government in India keeps saying that we are natural allies of the U.S. So there hasn't, I mean, it's not just a coincidence that this was not reported or that it's being suppressed, you know. The whole nuclear um, flashpoint with Pakistan was mostly due to the fact that the Indian government wanted to distract attention from the world's attention from Gujarat to this, and, and it was very, very successful in doing that. Well, if I hadn't read what you wrote about Gujarat and what happened there, I would never have known, because people in the United States uh, do not know what's happening in India. Yeah. In fact, people in the United States generally know very little about what is happening in the rest of the world. Thanks to the free press. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. You know. And, uh, and uh, it's clear that what we need more and more you know, is this you know, interchange across boundaries yeah. and the, the, the real globalization uh, yeah pe people's <laughs> globalization you know you talk about that and <laughs> yeah uh, and uh, you know, you know, because I sort of feel like you know I see I, I see the world with sort of chalk lines dividing everybody and I see us as having the job of little by little walking across and those rubbing them and out. rubbing yeah. those chalk lines out. That's why I keep, out, that's why I keep saying that I think literature is the opposite of a nuclear bomb. You know, yeah. when, when I wrote The God of Small Things, I would go to Estonia and Finland and hear from China and people would say, oh, but this was my childhood. One mm -hmm. of the reasons why I never wanted it to be made into a film was because I thought there are six or seven million films going on in people's heads and this one filmmaker will come and take it away, you know. Let it be the world's yes. child. Yes. And yes. You know, the, the, the idea that, that there, there is that, you know, that there is the human beings across the world do share love and terror and gentleness mm. and these things which, which, which literature links up and which nuclear bombs just build the walls and separate. Um, I think your coming here does that. <laughs> Not only your writing does that, but you, you're, you're coming here and us listening to you and knowing that you know, we are part of a caress. I don't know. Have any of you read Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle? You know, Kurt Vonnegut is, is this remarkable, you know, yeah, know. this, this <laughs> remarkable interesting, odd <laughs> mind, you see. And then Cass Cradley talks of a caress. Says, caress when people feel an affinity with one another. They don't know exactly why, but it's a, it crosses all lines. It crosses national, racial, sexual, it crosses yeah. all lines. But it's, that's what we depend on. Yeah. It's, it's like I, I've never been to Pakistan. You know, Delhi and Pakistan, I mean Lahore are maybe a one hour flight away from each other. I went to Pakistan last month. I had to go from Delhi to Dubai to Islamabad to Lahore. It took me 18 hours. <laughs> and um, you know, there's so much in the Indian press and equally in the Pakistan press about anti-India demonstrations and anti-Pakistan demonstrations and we're all going to kill each other and everybody hates everybody and so on. I, I landed in Lahore and Within, you know, seconds, we were all sitting at this dining table, and I felt like I was in Delhi. We were, it was, it was just mm. so sad, and, and the audience that came, people were just in tears, because, not because of me or what I said mm. or anything, just because 
it's such a relief not to always be subjected to this media's representation of government positions, you know. And I, I really feel that the media, the, the corporate media has played a terrible part in all this. And people are just going to have to blow holes in, mm. in, this, in this dam between mm. them and, mm. and uh, you know, insist on l listening to, to independent real voices, real human beings. Mm. Uh, we were saying to one another, when you were not listening, <laughs> uh, it's very hard to end a conversation on stage. <laughs> uh, and so the thought was that we would finish by Andati reading something that you would like to read to all of us. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, it'll just be two minutes. And um, it's just, it's, I just want to leave you with a, with a thought, with a way of seeing. Uh, this is part of um, the essay that I wrote when India tested nuclear weapons <coughs> in 1998. Uh, it's quite a long essay, so it's just a very small extract, a very pers the very personal part of it. Uh, in early May 1998, I left home for three weeks. While I was away, I met a friend of mine whom I've always loved for, among other things, her ability to combine deep affection with a frankness bordering on savagery. I've been thinking about you, she said, about the god of small things, what's in it, what's over it, under it, around it, above it. She fell silent for a while. I was uneasy and not at all sure that I wanted to hear the rest of what she had to say. She, however, was sure that she was going to say it. In this last year, less than a year actually, you've had too much of everything, fame, money, prizes, adulation, criticism, condemnation, ridicule, love, hate, anger, envy, generosity, everything. In some ways it's a perfect story, perfectly baroque in its excess. The trouble is that it has or can have only one perfect ending. Her eyes were on me, bright with a slanting, probing brilliance. She knew that I knew what she was going to say. She was insane. She was going to say that nothing that happened to me in the future could ever match the buzz of this, that the whole of the rest of my life was going to be vaguely dissatisfying, and therefore the only perfect ending to the story would be death. <laughs> my death. You've lived too long in New York, I told her. There are other worlds, other kinds of dreams, dreams in which failure is feasible, honorable, sometimes even worth striving for. Worlds in which recognition is not the only barometer of brilliance or, or human worth. There are plenty of warriors that I know and love, people far more valuable than myself, who go to war each day knowing in advance that they will fail. True, they're less successful in the most vulgar sense of the world, word, but by no means less fulfilled. The only dream worth having, I told her, is to dream that you will live while you're alive and die only when you're dead, which means exactly what she said, looking a little annoyed. <laughs> I tried to explain but didn't do a very good job of it because sometimes I need to write to think. So I wrote it down for her on a paper napkin and this is what I wrote. To love, to be loved, to never forget your own insignificance, to never get used to the unspeakable violence and the vulgar disparity of life around you, to seek joy in the saddest places, to pursue beauty to its lair, to never simplify what is complicated or complicate what is simple, to respect strength, never power, above all to watch, to try and understand, to never look away and never never to forget. Thank you.